Welcome to Waking with the Word this morning. We're in Proverbs chapter 22. It's verse 10 to verse 18. Drive out the mocker and out go strife. Quarrels and insults are ended. One who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. The eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge, but he frustrates the words of the unfaithful. The sluggard says, There's a lion outside. I'll be killed in the public square. The mouth of an adulterous woman is a deep pit. A man who is under the Lord's wrath falls into it. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. One who oppresses the poor to increase his wealth, and one who gives gifts to the rich, both come to poverty. Pay attention and turn your ear to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to watch what I teach, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and you have all of them ready on your lips. Today I am going to deliver to you what may seem like a hard word. It's a challenging word, but we can't Imagine that we would be anything else but challenged when we want to have a relationship with God. Because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. He is so big, so majestic, so incredible. To have a relationship with him and not be challenged would be impossible. We come today to one who is bigger and greater than us. And as mere human beings in the face of an almighty God. We expect to be challenged. So we begin with verse 10, which says, drive out the mocker. Now in the original, this word is more like scorner. And it actually means to make mouths. It can mean to interpret. Now, in the context of this scripture, what this is saying is not just that the person mocks within themselves, but that they have shown themselves to be a mocker. So this person is not mocking within or inside, but they've shown themselves. Their behavior, their attitude is mocking other people. It's scorning other people. In other words, they have contempt for other people. And the word to drive out in the Hebrew means to cast out, which actually means to divorce, to completely separate from. And then it says, when we do this, out goes strife, quarrels and insults are ended. In the Hebrew, we have the word contention, which can mean brawling, quarreling, or it can mean a contest. Do you know... Sometimes people act in such a way that it almost makes us feel like we're in a continual contest with them. But this is not someone who has love for you. It's someone who treats you with contempt. Now, sometimes this contempt can come from a deep insecurity. A need to lift yourself up above others because underneath you feel extremely insecure. The word contention here also means discord. Because when you have contempt for other people or someone has contempt for you, when you're constantly pitting yourself against somebody else, there's no unity there. Team players think of one another. They don't put others before themselves. They put themselves right in the middle of the team with other people. So it's not that they're forgotten and other people come first. And it's not that they're first and other people are forgotten. It's that we're all in this together. As they say in High School Musical, each person is valued and wanted. And you, being a team player, would know that you are valued that you are wanted, that you are an integral part of whatever it is you are doing. Now, maybe it's a family, or maybe it's a friendship group, or maybe it's at work. But being a team player means you are just as important as everybody else, and everybody else is just as important as you. This reminds me 
of the second commandment. Love your neighbour as you love yourself. The Lord wants you to have love for yourself and for everybody else, to be able to treat others as you would like to be treated. Now this does not mean that everybody wants to be treated the same. Instead of thinking of, well, what would I want in that situation? We're meant to think, that person is as valuable as me. What would they want in this situation? And then we have another word, and that is reproach, which means disgrace, confusion, dishonour, and ignominy. Ignominy is a word we don't use very often, but it means public disgrace. When we have contempt for other people, for whatever reason that is, and when we act with contempt towards them, it brings disgrace and shame upon them. And we have the word strife. And the word strife in this verse actually means judgment or condemnation. So for whatever reason we act with contempt towards someone else, even if we think they deserve it, it breeds discord. And discord makes any family, any team, any friendship group, any workplace fail and fall apart. Contest begins when one person is fighting against another person. Strife begins and public shame is the result. Now, sometimes people can act very, very unkindly towards us. They can act with scorn towards us and it can breed within us the desire to be in competition with them. But we must take warning from this verse. Brothers and sisters, dear friends, we're all on the same level. And just because someone treats me with contempt does not mean that I need to choose, even when my emotions tell me to, it does not mean I need to choose to treat them with contempt. This verse tells me that the moment I am treated with contempt, a contest will start within myself. Someone treating me with contempt makes me feel like I'm in a contest with them. But the challenge that God is giving us today is that we won't take that contest, that we won't listen to the enemy, who is the one who derails us and devalues us and shames us and accuses us. Recently, I was at a funeral of a lovely man. And after the funeral, I met a lady that I hadn't seen for years. This lady had been part of our missionary society and a dear, dear friend of mine. As she spoke to my family, she began with my brother who is an opera singer in London. She spoke to him and smiled at him and ingratiated herself with him. Then she moved on to me. She asked me what I was doing and when I went to tell her, she told me what I was doing. She got it wrong, but she didn't even give me time to tell her what I was really doing. And when she told me what I was doing, she used the word only. Her wording was, oh yes, you're only doing this, aren't you? Well, straight away within myself, there arose a feeling of contest. I thought I have to tell her that I'm not only doing that. I want to tell her all the other things that I am doing. I want her to see me as well as she's seen my brother. It wasn't until we were on the way home as I sat with my mum and my other brother, who works in hospitality, and also has one of the kindest hearts you could ever meet, that I realised she had completely blanked him. She didn't even speak to him, but he was right there beside us. The question is why? She knew him just as well, but to this lady, he wasn't worth speaking to. 
And I know this because this dear lady has done this sort of thing on many occasions before. She ingratiates herself with those that people see as important or as successful. My younger brother said to me, at least you got spoken to. I usually get blanked. With a heavy and hurtful heart, I said to him, I'm so sorry. I didn't know people treated you that way. And he said, I'm used to it but it doesn't bother me, because I know who I am. And I was so glad that the feeling of contest had not reached my little brother, that he had learnt to be secure in who he is. And I pray that that continues for my dear brother. Because when we allow people, or the enemy through people's behaviour, because we're all human and we all have faults, when we allow this, it strips us of our peace. And it strips us of our peace on the inside, first of all, which then makes us act out scorn. And we're the one that shows a contempt for other people. Sometimes we think, well, they've shown contempt for us, so we show contempt for them because we have this sense of contest, this sense of I have to be something, I have to show that I'm as good, I have to be recognised. It brings strife, it brings public shame, it brings discord. Now, why do people do that to us in the first place? Because their feeling exactly how they make you feel when they do it to you. They have that sense of insecurity, of not being noticed, of not being good enough and having no peace. And very often when they come up with, against someone or they meet someone who has got that peace, who has got that security, who just is getting on with life, whether they're being what the world would call successful or whether they're just getting on with life quietly, that disturbs them because they haven't got that. They might be searching for it, but they haven't got it. And they want to align themselves with people and be seen with people who are successful in the hope that they would be counted among the successful. It's a lack of self-worth and a lack of self-peace and a lack of self-contentment. And it breeds a lack of self-contentment. We can never be team players when we are not content within ourselves. And the enemy loves to lie to us. He loves to pit us against one another. He loves to put us into a contest against each other. And so there needs to be wisdom. And in this verse it says to cast out the one who is acting this way, to divorce them. Now I want to talk about divorce here and I want to talk about it in this context. How do I divorce somebody who is treating me with scorn and contempt and yet I don't want to treat them in the same way? Well, when Joseph was going to divorce Mary, he did it quietly. He says he was going to put her aside secretly. Why? Because he didn't want to dishonour her. He didn't want to make a public shame of her. And here's the thing. When we choose to make a public shame of someone, we're actually doing the same thing as what they have done to us because we're treating that person with contempt. Now, you might say, no, Emily, they're getting the consequences of their actions, but we're not God. And God has made us all the same, part of being team players, part of being in his family, part of treating others as we would like them to be treated and loving others as we love ourselves, which is why the Lord says, love your enemies, is because even though there are enemies, even though they treat us badly, we are meant to value them as human beings. Let me say it again, even though they treat us badly, we are meant to value them as human beings. 
So the moment I want to publicly shame someone, I am not treating them as a valuable human being. I am exposing them. I am shaming them. I am ridiculing them. So Joseph wanted to break the agreement with Mary, but do it without bringing public shame. We need to also do it without bringing a form or a sense of contest or a sense of discord. How hard is this? We must treat others as we want to be treated. We must love them and value them as human beings. But that does not always mean that they are to be in a position in our lives where they can come and bring that sense of contest or where they can come and bring that discord on the inside of me or on the inside of you. And strife in this verse means condemnation and judgment. So when someone again is treating me as less valuable, as a less valuable human being, perhaps devaluing the way my mind works or my heart works, that brings judgment. That brings a sense of condemnation upon me. But I am not to bring it back upon them. I stood in a meeting once and in front of me was a dear minister who lifted both hands right up to the sky and it was in front of everybody in this congregation, which was fine. But this minister that week had sent out an email and it had come to me and other people. And it was a general email, but in this email he had pinpointed homosexuals. And he had written really derogatively about them. He had written things about how we should stand up for homosexuals to not have rights. How we should fight against certain things that were happening for homosexuals to be able to be treated in our country exactly the same as how other people are treated. This was an issue of human rights, not an issue of religious freedom, but an issue of human rights for a certain kind of people. And this minister was standing against those very people having human rights. And these human rights were amongst other humans, not before God. This was an issue of how we treat other people not an issue of how God sees our behaviour. Quite apart from what we think we know about how God sees certain people groups, he has commanded us to value every human being the same, to not bring public shame upon them, to not cause them discord, to not judge them and condemn them. And we are often right in saying there is a difference between condemnation and judgment and discernment. There's a difference between me knowing for myself what is right and wrong, good or bad, good or evil for me, and judging somebody else and putting them down and telling them that there's no hope for them. There's, those two things are very, very different, but within what I feel is good for me. I am meant to honour every other human being as a human being. I am meant to never pit myself against anyone and try and act as if I'm better or more worthy or greater. I am not in any form or way meant to bring up somebody's history, their past, their mistakes and their failings, and definitely not in an attempt to condemn them or judge them or make them feel small. I am meant to, as someone who knows the Lord, I am meant to fight for the rights of every human being that walks this planet because God made every human being that walks this planet and I am not meant to see people as only their achievements. 
and value and honour those who seem successful, be it in Christian circles or secular circles or whatever it may be. My behaviour is meant to be the same for every human being and that includes myself. I am meant to love myself, honour myself and not see myself as in any form of contest with anybody else. But this dear man had sent an email in which he had put himself in contest with homosexuals because he had said in this email that they were not to have the rights that he was to have human rights and then he raised his hands to heaven and I am being honest here but I looked at that man and I said how can you worship God this is what I said in my heart how can you worship God and raise your hands in this room when you have cast people out and made out that people just like you should not have a right to be included or if they came into our service of worship should be told where we think they've gone wrong and straight away the Holy Spirit came to me and he said Emily just because he would cast people out does not mean you cast him out just because he would not be make some people welcome does not mean that you don't make him welcome just because he may think these thoughts about other people does not mean you think them about him and I was thoroughly rebuked by the Holy Spirit because just because somebody else chooses to treat you with contempt does not mean that you need to respond. It's the enemy's enticement to do this to me and to do this to you. Every time he comes to us, he makes us feel small. When he came to Jesus during the temptation, what did he say? He said, if you are the son of God. When he came to Adam and Eve, what did he say? He said, you shall not die. God knows that when you eat that fruit, you will be like him. And in those words was that hidden lie. God has made you smaller. You're smaller. You're weaker. God thinks he's better than you. And that's what Satan does every time he wants to entice us. He will give us the feeling that we have to fight for who we are. We have to show what we are and we have to tell the world it's okay. And we have to make sure people see us and make sure people hear us. And we cannot be overlooked. But do you know something? The minute we feel that way, we are going to act out in a fashion that is going to publicly shame us, that is going to cause discord, that is going to cause judgment and condemnation, and it's going to pass it on to someone else as well, because we're going to fight in that contest, and the contest is not going to stop, and someone like my little brother is going to be overlooked by your or my behaviour, because we feel small. And it's time today to say no more. And how do we do this? I don't have very long now in this broadcast. So how do we do this? Verse 11 says, one who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king as a friend. Very, very briefly, that word pure is also found only one other time in the Old Testament. And it's in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 and it says your eyes are too pure to look on evil you cannot tolerate wrongdoing why then do you tolerate the treacherous why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves and this is Habakkuk talking to God and he says God your eyes are too pure to look on evil and yet he can't understand it because this God whose eyes are too pure to look on the evil, seems to be overlooking the evil and allowing the evil to go on. 
We have Psalms where King David says, Lord, you allow the sun to rise on the wicked and on the good. We know our God is pure. His eyes are completely clean and holy. He has nothing to do with the one who makes you feel small. But remember, it's not really the person. They are tainted by a disease that you have as well, the disease of sin, the disease of shame, the disease of insecurity. But Satan is the one who comes with absolute negativity to knock you down, to tell you that you're not. These words are not from the one who is pure. But we are to do as God does. And we are not to get involved with the contest. Now, loves. He who loves a pure heart. The word loves here means affection. And to speak with grace actually means to speak with favour or with kindness. So if I love purity, then I'm going to choose, no matter what happens or who devalues me, I'm going to choose to speak with kindness. And I'm going to speak with kindness because I value that other person as a human being. Even when they try to despitefully use me, even when they hurt me deliberately, and even when they overlook me, whether it be deliberately or not, even when they send an email out about me or about a certain kind of people group or about my kind of people group, I'm going to speak with kindness. I'm going to speak with grace and I'm going to speak with favour because that's how my father speaks. He speaks with kindness. He speaks with grace. He speaks with love. I am not the one who is to judge nor to condemn. I am not the one who is to bring contest nor discord. Even when I feel insecure, I'm not to pit myself against someone else or to put them down. I am not the one who is to bring public shame or even private shame upon any other human being. I am commanded to love. I am commanded to hold every human being as valuable as every other human being. And here's the hard truth, beloved. No matter what they have done. No matter what they have done. The Lord is the judge. As Paul said, we all see through a glass dimly. So how do I divorce myself from the one who acts out in scorn? I divorce myself by treating them the same as everybody else. I divorce myself from the reaction that I would have to their behaviour. I do not cast them aside in any public way, not even any private way. But I can have boundaries and I can put these boundaries into place in wisdom. I don't have to constantly allow myself to see people devaluing me or devaluing other human beings. But I also don't have to respond by treating them with contempt. I removed people from my Facebook a few years ago because they continually posted things which devalued other people groups. And this hurt me every day of my life. I came to the point where I said, Lord, do I have to listen to this and look at this every day just to value that person? And he gently made me realise, no, you don't have to make yourself sick listening to other people putting people down. But you don't have to publicly post something back to get at that person or to reverse their opinion. You can gently take them off your Facebook and when they ask you or if they ask you why, you can tell them because I don't want to see posts where people are put down, and that hurt me every day. But you can still love them as your friend. We need to be very careful how we treat people, no matter how they're treating us. If we keep our hearts pure, if we keep our eyes clean, then we will be able to speak with kindness in the face of hatred, and we will have the King for a friend. Today, in the Come Back to God campaign, we are praying because people are suffering from disease and starvation in this world. 
Today, let's remember the people of Yamen. The suffering they are going through is beyond our comprehension, but not beyond the power of the Almighty to change the hearts and the circumstances. And we want to pray for you if you need your heart to be changed. If you need circumstances to be different and for God to work in them, then we'd love to hear from you. I say this every day, but it doesn't mean it gets any less meaningful every day because we mean it with all of our hearts. So remember we're here. Have a really good day. I'm going to see you again tomorrow. Lots of love and God bless you.